Hi, my name's Annie Lucas and I'm the founder of Start to Stitch. In this tutorial I'm going to show you some methods for darning moth-eaten holes in your favourite knitwear, but I'm also going to show you some basic embroidery techniques for creating some decorative motifs which you can use to decorate or disguise the mends or embellish the mends depending on how you want to frame it and what you want to do with your knitwear. In order to mend the uh, holes in your moth-eaten knitwear you're going to need some basic pieces of equipment. The first thing you're going to need is a selection of embroidery floss or thread. Um, these come in lengths of eight meters. They can either be polyester or 100% cotton. The, the better quality ones tend to be cotton um, and they are six eight they're eight meter lengths on the roll but they are six strands it's sometimes known as stranded cotton so in order to complete your mends in in this tutorial i'll you'll need to split the thread but i'll show you how to do that in the next step so you need your thread you're going to need a, a needle a darning needle a traditional darning needle may well be a little bit too chunky uh, so for this tutorial I've been using a size 3 cruel needle, um, which is one of these, but something with a reasonable size eye and a blunt or semi-blunt point um, is the best. You don't want too sharp a point, but having a little bit of sharpness on the point of your needle is helpful when it comes to the embroidery techniques afterwards. You may find that you actually need to use two needles, a darning needle for the mending, um, and a cruel for the embroidery, uh, although I use a cruel in this tutorial all the way through. Uh, a little pair of scissors is always useful for snipping. And then in order to complete your mends, you will find a darning mushroom, a traditional wooden darning mushroom or some other curved object, some people use a tennis ball, um, useful and an embroidery hoop will also come in very very handy um, for the embroidery part of this project though again is not totally vital and you can just use a darning mushroom which is what I'll use um, when I show you the techniques and finally you will need a, a piece of muslin or a thin tea towel just to press your darns with a steamy iron once you have made them as that shrinks everything back and makes it nice and, nice and flat before you start embroidering it. The first technique I'm going to show you is a traditional darn and for that we're going to try and make it as uh, invisible as possible within the knitwear that has a moth hole that you can see here. So we need to choose some threads that will tone in. For your knitwear you'll obviously need to find a thread that will tone in unless you're doing something that you want to be very very visible. Part of the reason that I'm doing this is I want to show you how you can mix and combine uh, these threads. So the two colours that I think would work best mixed with each other are these two, which I think when split and mixed together will work really well uh, on the darn. So I'm going to show you how to split the thread. You need to cut a length of your embroidery thread like that and then you can split the stranded cotton or the thread or the floss whichever term you're using to describe it like that so I'm going to split it into two two skeins of three threads each you want to just split it at the top like that and then hold the two skeins apart and then you can very carefully run your finger down the center of the thread and untwist as you go. You'll find that because it's all twisted together you can just untwist you don't have to run your finger down but I find running the finger down does sometimes help um, keep it all in order. Um, if you let go like that that's exactly what will happen it will twist back, back up again but you can just carry on untwisting and running your finger down the whole length of the 
thread until it's completely split out. So I have three strands of that um, mushroomy colour and I'm going to mix them with three strands of the cream which I've already split out and I'm simply going to thread those through the eye of my needle before I start darning. You will be using six threads for the this particular darn um, but for everything else in this project you will be using uh, three threads, single, single skeins of three threads but this is a com combined skein of six. When you're mending you will always start and end in the same way and that's by uh, weaving your thread ends into the reverse of the work rather than uh, tying a knot. Because knitwear tends to essentially be quite loose fabric, tying a knot can just result in the knot pulling through and things not being secure. It's much better to weave the ends through. So here is my moth-eaten uh, hole. You can see on this sweater that there are um, some what look like wriggly lines but they also operate within columns. These columns are known as whales uh, and when we come to the darning we're going to use, use, the, use the whales as part of the structure of the darn. But to simply and quickly demonstrate how we can start our work, if you just slide your needle in underneath a few of the stitches uh, on, on the reverse, this is the back, I've turned this inside out, on the back of your uh, sweater and just pull it through so that the ends are hidden and then double back on yourself, parallel to it, just picking up those stitches and pulling your thread back again, your work will actually be really nice and secure and isn't going to go anywhere as you start your darn. And then when you want to finish, you can do it in exactly the same way by, um, by going up and down again within, within the whales of the sweater, like this. But you can also uh, weave your threads in crossways like this and back again. The most important thing is that you sort of double back on yourself every time or you can do that within the back of the embroidered section so that the threads are actually within the embroidery and not uh, not just separately from the embroidery on the back of the sweater elsewhere. The main thing is that the ends are woven in um, into, the, into the work in an invisible way on the reverse. So to make a traditional mend, you need to turn your knitwear onto, well, inside out so that you're working on the reverse. Insert your darning mushroom inside the sweater and gently hold the knitwear around the handle so that the, the area to be mended is, is visible uh, and easy to access for your stitching. You don't want to overstretch it, uh, nor do you want to understretch it. It's just a question of getting it to the point where the work doesn't really move around too easily on the top, uh, but the hole isn't made any worse. We're going to start the darn about a centimetre away from the hole as I demonstrated earlier on in this video. So I'm just going to work my way through a whale and then bring the thread back again on itself. And we're going to carry on in this manner making parallel lines of stitching that go about a centimetre above and about a centimetre below the hole to be mended so that we're reinforcing the area around the mend as well as filling in the moth hole itself. So I'm working from right to left, up and down and as we do this we are going to get to the hole itself. You're going to carry on making parallel lines that go over the hole because essentially with this method what we're going to be doing is recreating some fabric using the, the thread inside the hole. And as you go just make sure you're picking up the sti individual stitches as you can see with my needle here uh, around the edge of the hole just to prevent it growing bigger. 
and you keep going like that until you've moved your way all the way over to the other side and gone about a centimetre past. When you have successfully worked a row of parallel lines of stitching across your hole, you're going to turn your work a quarter turn uh, or 90 degrees and we're going to start working parallel lines going back again but this time they're going to be at right angles to the lines that we've just made. So you can see that I don't have whales um, going in this direction so I'm just lightly picking up some of the threads as I go. It's a bit rough and ready but it's another that's another reason for coordinating the colours and I'm going to do the same thing coming back. Ultimately what you're aiming to do is when you get to the hole itself and you're working your way across it you're going to be essentially weaving with your needle under and over and under and over very closely together under each thread and over, under and over, so that you are weaving what is essentially new material in the hole but is embedded in the fabric of the garment itself because it extends beyond. So in the previous row where you've gone over you want to go under so you're reversing it just like traditional weaving was at school and is still. Pick up your threads like that so you can you can see that I've picked up a few, gone under a few and over a few and that that's in reverse to what I had just done previously and you carry on like that. If you go over that one, carry on like that across the hole until you have completed your, your darn. When you've got to the end and you've successfully woven all of your uh, threads together to create this new fabric in the middle, you just need to finish off by weaving the threads, weaving the needle in backwards and forwards on itself in a different direction to what you finished with the actual darn, like this and then you can snip it off. Turn it round to the right side, take the mushroom out, turn it round to the right side and you can see that you have a pretty well coordinated darn there. And if you find that it's a little bit misshapen, um, this is where your pressing cloth and a steamy iron can come in. Don't iron directly onto the knitwear, just put the pressing cloth tea towel or an old bit of muslin down and apply a bit of heat with some steam and that will take the uh, anything that's a little bit distorted out of the mend. The next mending technique I'm going to show you is a blanket stitch darn which I also call a cobweb darn but I don't know whether that's actually uh, a technical name for it or not. So I've started uh, the work on the reverse as we've done with uh, previous techniques and I have pulled the thread through to the right side of the work and we're going to work on the right side now. The first thing I'm going to do is just put, poke my needle back in underneath so that it is coming out just outside the mend and I'm going to make a very quick row of circle even of running stitches that just go all the way around the hole to be mended about half a centimetre away. can be pretty rough and ready, doesn't need to be immaculate um, and the stitches themselves need to be relatively small, about half a centimetre again. So there you go, gone all the way around the outside and then you want to pull that slightly taut so that the you can see that the lines of the knit are parallel with each other and everything is restored to where you want it to be and the we're going to make a blanket stitch. So in order to make a blanket stitch you have your thread folded up and away from you. We're going to poke the needle in, push the needle in below the ring of 
running stitch that you made and bring it up through the hole and then this piece of thread is going to go behind the needle and then you pull the stitch tight. I'm going to show you with that again. So you put the needle in but below the running stitch, poke it up through the centre of the hole, run the thread behind the needle and then pull the stitch tight. And you'll see as I'm doing that, that it starts to effectively seal off the edge um, of the mend. There's a little bit of a blob of knitwear there that can do with just being poked towards the back. So outside of the running stitch up through the middle and keep going all the way round. When you've gone full circle with your blanket stitches you'll come back um, to the beginning and you just want to take your needle and run it underneath that first stitch that you made and pull the thread through so that essentially you've got you can then have a, a continuous line of fairly uniform blanket stitch. We're then going to carry on round making a second ring of blanket stitches working into the stitches that we have just made. So we're not working into the knitwear anymore, we're working into the stitches that we've just made, going in like this. And you need to pull them really tight as you go. Keep going all the way around, pulling them tight, working into the row below and spiral until you have completely filled the whole area with your blanket stitch. When you have finished the, filled in the whole of the mend with the blanket stitches going in a spiral as previously shown, uh, you need to take your darning mushroom out and poke the needle through the centre of the mend and go onto the reverse of your work to just weave your threads in and finish off like this. And you may find that again a pressing cloth and a steamy iron will just help smooth everything out. The final mending technique I'm going to show you is an eyelet mend and this is particularly good for making a feature in the centre of a piece of embroidery. This mend doesn't fill the hole, it just seals the hole in a decorative way so that you do make a feature of the, of the hole that's been made by the hungry moths eating your uh, sweaters. So I've started as I did with the blanket stitch darn. Um, I started on the reverse and then I came through to the front and did a ring of running stitch. And I'm now going to work a blanket stitch again, but this time I'm going to do it in, in the reverse way uh, to the darn. So my thread is coming out um, on the outside of the running stitch, which you which you can't really see because it's a similar colour to the sweater but is in exactly the same place as the blanket stitch. I'm going to put the needle now through the hole uh, that I'm mending and bring it up next to where the thread is emerges. Make sure that the thread basically is going behind where you're pulling the needle up and that is your first blanket stitch and we're going to work blanket stitches all the way round in this way very, very close together, making sure that when you bring the needle up, you're bringing it up outside of the ring of running stitches that you made. So in through the hole, up outside of the ring of stitches, in through the hole, up through the outside of the ring of stitches, make sure your thread runs behind the needle and then pull it tight. And that's again in through the hole, up outside the ring of stitches. Make sure that your thread runs behind the needle and then pull it tight. And you'll see that as you go, you're making a, you're starting to make a feature 
of the, st of the stitches which are essentially sealing in um, the mend and you keep going all the way like that until you get to till you get to the beginning again. Once you have gone all the way around um, you just need to do what you did with the beginning of the blanket stitch in the previous um, darning method, the, the blanket stitch darn, and you just need to run your thread underneath the first stitch that you've made so that you can essentially make it a continuous loop and you can see that what's happened there is it has completely sealed in that hole and made quite a nice feature of it. Uh, you will then put your needle through to the reverse, finish it off and um, as you've been shown and that is your eyelet mend. I'm now going to quickly demonstrate the embroidery stitches that are used in all of the decorative motifs that are covered in this project. The motifs themselves are described in more detail in the blog post and downloadable photo guide that accompanies this tutorial, but I wanted to show you each of these embroidery stitches in real time so that you have a, a physical demo as well as uh, a stills image or diagram. The first one we're going to look at is um, a, a variation on a stitch called Lazy Daisy Stitch and we're using this to create the petals in uh, various floral motifs um, in this project. So the main thing is you want to try and keep your stitches relatively even in size, um, width at the bottom and uh, length of the petal. So your thread will come out of the work in the bottom left hand corner of the petal. You want to think about how wide you want that petal to be, poke your needle in that distance away from where it's emerged and then also think about how long you want your needle your petal to be and bring your needle out at the correct distance for length but make sure that where the needle is coming out is kind of equidistant between these two points the 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 left hand corner and right hand corner of the petal make sure that the thread goes behind your needle and then pull it all tight and you'll see why ultimately you want the thread behind the needle because as the thread comes out of the hole where it's emerged it will then secure the petal shape in place so to give it one final bit of security you poke the needle back in again um, to the hole that you've come out of basically uh, but on the other side of the thread so the thread has come out here and your needle is going to go back in on the other side of the thread and you can bring the needle out where you want the next petal to start, so about there. It's essentially two stitches that you're making and that is your petal. So just to show you again, it's coming out here and I want the, the petal to be about half a centimetre, three quarters of a centimetre wide at the bottom and about a centimetre and a half in height. So I'm bringing the needle out halfway between those two points, making sure that the loop of thread runs behind the thread that's coming out, poking my needle back in again to secure it in place, and then bringing it back out again where I would like the next petal to start. And you carry on like that, working all the way around um, to make as many petal shapes as you require for your design. We use French knots quite a lot in these designs as well, so I'll quickly talk you through how to make uh, one of those. You can hopefully see I've made a couple there already. And in this particular design, it's nice if they're kind of randomly spaced around to fill in the central part of the flower. These petals are a little bit uneven because I've done them in a hurry, but um, yours, I'm sure, will be a lot more streamlined. Um, so you take your needle in your right hand and your thread in your left hand coming out and your needle and the thread need to be traveling in the same direction so the needle is traveling in in the same direction towards your left hand and the thread is traveling towards your left hand hold your needle parallel to the thread and then wrap the thread around three or four times pull all those wraps tightly together to start to form the knot and then poke your needle back not very far away from where it came out but not in the same place because 
with a darn you might pull the knot all the way through. So it's gone in very close to where it came out and I'm just bringing it out a little way away. As it's gone in I want to make sure that these wraps are pulled reasonably tight but not so tight that they're going to stop the needle sliding through. Pull the needle very gently through all of those wraps and you'll see that what happens is that locks the knot, knot in place. So I'll just show you that again. The thread runs out of the work towards your left hand and the needle is in your right hand and the needle is also travelling towards your left hand. Wrap the thread around the needle three or four times. Bunch the wraps up together so that you can start to form the knot. Poke the needle back in again close to where it came out and then bring it out somewhere else. Start to bring it out somewhere else and as you do that just make sure that these wraps stay nicely secure together as you push the needle all the way through and wiggle it through so as not to pull the knot through the darn and then pull gently through and you are starting to make a series of really lovely French knots randomly placed and they can be slightly random in size as well you can wrap you know maybe five or six times in one knot and three or four in others which means that you'll get a variation on the shape and size of them um, which adds character and texture to the embroidered work. Chain stitch is uh, very similar to the lazy daisy stitch which is also quite similar to the technique for a blanket stitch in the sense that you bring your needle out and you're running the thread behind it. What, we, what we're going to be doing is making a chain of stitches that interconnect with each other and, and so each one secures each other in place. So the first thing we want to do is make our first chain. Then the, the thread is coming out of the work. We want to poke our needle back into almost the same place where the, th the thread is coming out and bring our needle up the length at which we want to make the chain. Make sure that the thread runs behind the needle like that and then pull it tight and then we would just repeat that so you're going back in to where your thread is coming out pulling your needle out the distance that you want the length of the chain to be making sure that the thread runs behind the needle and pulling it tight and that is how you make a simple line of chain stitch when you go all the way round, if you want to join it in a circle, when you get back here, all you need to do when you make the final chain is run it behind where you started, like that. And I'll just quickly demonstrate, you'll see loosely how you can finish. You run your final stitch through where you've started and then go back in there and you have a complete continuous chain. Stem stitch is a really useful stitch to know about because you can use it to create outlines as well as the obvious stems for floral motifs and designs. Um, it's a sort of variation on a, on a back stitch if you know what a back stitch is, whereas essentially you're working backwards in order to move forwards. And the stitches are slightly offset against each other in order to make a thicker line than you would with a straightforward back stitch. So the thread is, is coming out of the work in in a direction where it's heading to my left and we are going to bring it over to the right and put the needle in where we want the stitch to end, this stitch to end and then we're going to bring it back up again halfway along because that's where we want the next stitch to start. Pull it taut so you can see it's heading off to the left we're going to fold it back over to the right, poke the needle in where we want that stitch to end and bring it up again halfway along the stitch which is where we want the next stitch to begin. And you'll see as you go you're making quite a nice thick defined row of stitching that can create the stem of a floral motif. Finally I'm going to show you satin stitch which is 
uh, a, similar really to the darn in the sense that you are making a row of parallel stitches going across each other um, well parallel to each other across a direction close together so that you're essentially filling in an area with long stitches that are close together to to essentially color in an, an area with thread so my thread is coming out at the bottom here this is a leaf shape on the um, scandi type flower um, my thread is coming up at the bottom here i'm going to poke it in at the top where i want um, this next stitch to end and then bring it back out again almost directly out of the same space but just slightly prior to where it's come out so you make a stitch like that and you can see I've made a stitch parallel so I'm going back in at the top right next to the stitch I just made and bring the needle out at the bottom right next to where the thread is coming out and you just keep working across that way slowly slowly you will find that you are filling in the area and that is what is known as a satin stitch so there you go three methods for fixing holes in your favorite sweaters and three beautiful designs that you can use to disguise or embellish those men's if you decide to even if you don't decide to embroider your mending i do hope that these techniques have given you the wherewithal to make sure that your much loved knitwear can stay in circulation for longer and will keep you warm this winter. <laughs>